worship. So, Father, thank you so much for uh, today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the family together. God, um, we're excited uh, to be in your midst. We have an expectation that you will meet us. And so, uh, Lord Jesus, we pray because you are the shepherd of this church that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us your encouragement, your kindness, your gladness of heart, Lord, and that we would uh, actually have an encounter with you, our risen God. We pray this in your name, Christ. Amen. Hey, so thank you for coming um, today. It's always a big thank you for coming, but I know it seems like it's been raining for like three years, and uh, I just want to say sometimes that is an easy way to check out, just be like, hey, I'm not going to you know, make the effort to be there, but I, it's, a, it's an awesome thing when I get to lay eyes on you, and, and I don't know if it's awesome if you get to lay eyes on me, but we get to lay eyes on each other, and we get to see one another, and there's something about you being here and me hugging you and talking to you that, that really matters. It really matters. And so I just want to say, like, I, it's not for, uh, it's, it doesn't go unnoticed on mornings like this when you kind of pack up the crew, if you have a crew or if it's just yourself, and you make a decision to come and gather with the family. It actually really matters. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we're going to be uh, going into week four and five of this current series uh, in Nehemiah, where we're going to take a look at the word and the idea of family. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to give you kind of a heads up of what's coming this summer. We've got a really cool summer series uh, that's right around the corner. It's not uh, next week, but the following week, June 10th, and it's called Smile. Smile. I think we have a, uh, yes, look at that guy. I mean, how can you not do a series with this graphic? I mean, this, this kid win, wins it right there. Um, the, the name of the title, or the, the title of the series is called Smile, the Art of Being Happy, where we're going to actually look at what, what does it take to be really happy. Um, and, and we're going to go ahead and lean into that word happy, and we're not going to like do that dissecting thing where it's like Christians are joyful, not happy. That's just weird, so don't do that. Okay? We can be happy. We're supposed to be happy, and we serve an amazingly happy God. And we're going to talk about that God. We're going to talk about His pursuit for your happiness and how we, how we actually join Him in that. So it's going to be four weeks of taking a look at what are some of the rhythms of people who are happy in Christ, and, and how do we get there? And, and maybe it's an invite point for one of your friends and family who doesn't normally come to church, or maybe church is like a little bit um, too heavy for them, or it's just not their thing. One, one of the cool things that I've been learning in preparing for this particular uh, sermon series is that happiness is like the universal quest of everyone. Christian, Buddhist, but it doesn't matter. Like everyone is trying their hardest to be happy. And it's just that we actually have the market on happiness in Christ. So we want to go ahead and invite people to a series uh, where we explore this idea of, of being happy. And, uh, and so I'd love for you to do that. So it's June 10th. That would be awesome. So uh, in... To, in preparation, in preparation for this particular message on family, because we learned so much about leadership last week from um, exploring leadership songs. You guys remember that? I don't know if you, if you were here last week. We explored some like imagine all the people, man in the mirror. Can't think of any two because those are the two that get stuck in my head. But we had a couple of songs last week. I figured we would do start off the same way with a really important internet list on instead of leadership. Families, okay, and so what we're this is going to kind of get us get our motor started here for families. These are um, titled the 60 greatest TV families of all time. All right, the 60 greatest TV families of all time. So your mind should be thinking who might be on this list. Obviously, I edit it. We're not going to go through all 60, but these are a few. And you know, if you think this was a great you know, uh, a TV family, give a shout out, give a little applause, give a like, yes, amen, whatever, however it is that you want to respond to this. So uh, I'll let you know the number one ranked family. The number one ranked family of all time, TV family, was the Brady Bunch. I don't know if you, the Brady's, okay, you, that might be like, that might appeal to like 10 of you who are here this morning who are old enough to remember that. That's cool though, that's cool. Um, along that list, in the top 10, was uh, the Sopranos. Sopranos, okay, a little Italian music. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, and then right after them was the Bunkers. Again, going back to my own, a little bit of an older crowd, uh, all in the family. And then we had the Connors. Uh, Roseanne got, got a mention in there. And then we had uh, the Ewings. The, does anybody know the Ewings? <laughs> no, okay, okay. So this is totally, so my parents, my, this, is, this is awesome parenting on my, it makes me feel good about my parenting. Remember, you ever look at your parents' parenting and you're like, I don't feel so bad about my, like, 
mixed up parenting. So my parents would be pretty conservative, like you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And they were, you know, like, I was raised on Dobson, so I had like really healthy, loving boundaries. But then all of a sudden, I'd be like popping french fries, watching like JR on like Dallas. And, like, now that I look back at that, I'm not sure I should have been watching the Ewings at the young age that I was. But it's cool because it makes me feel good about sometimes, you know, I'm not always super consistent on my parenting either. How about the Cleavers? The Cleavers? Yeah. I don't know why all these families are like older families in the movies. Um, the Adams family, okay? That's the one that's like, da -da -da -da. right? That's the Adams, isn't it? Because I know there's some weird other monster family that's not going to. Uh, and then there's the Waltons. Again, maybe the person like writing this list a little bit, age, I don't know. So here are some honorable mentions that didn't make the top 10. Are you ready? Uh, the Bundys. You know you love Al Bundy. Don't lie. It's not unchristian to like Al Bundy. He just needs Jesus. It's cool. Uh, the Crawleys from downtown Abbey. The Flintstones. Uh, the Foremans from that 70s show. Uh, the Jeffersons. Now, I don't know if that was like moving on up Jeffersons or the like Space Age Jeffersons. Uh, the, uh, the Simpsons. Okay. Thank you, Homer. Arch. Oh, yes. I've got noise effects. Thank you, Abbey Church. And then the last one was one of my favorites that was super formative to me uh, because I was actually becoming a young adult and, and walking through some like growing up issues. And so I got to be highly influenced by this family with the address of 90210, the Walshes. The Walshes. Okay. So that might explain a lot about some of the issues I have, all the shows I watch kind of coming up. Uh, but that's just a little bit of a, like, you know, a survey on some TV families. And what's interesting is that families, each of these families had a message, right? Like, we really wanted to dive into it because culture speaks and music and TV and movies, they all speak a message. So if I were to name one of these families, they each would have a message. If I had to say, what was the message of the Sopranos, or what was the message of the Cleavers, or what was the... So they would each have a message. What's really cool is your family has a message. Like the Roses, they have a message. Smiths, they have a message. Wanamakers, have a message. So we would go down the list. Every family right next to it, it has a message that the entire world, especially the world that's intimate to that family, is reading and experiencing all day long. Your kids are drinking deeply of your family's message and will repeat it to a degree and therefore when the time is right. Do you know that Delray Beach and the surrounding area is reading the message of the Avenue Church? Like we as a church family also have a message it's loud, it's quiet, it's, it, it's very um, tangible at some points, at some points it's somewhat philosophical. But, but the point is that, that we too are a family here at the Avenue Church, and we too have a message that's walking right alongside of us. A question that we're going to explore today is what is that message? And how, how do we join God in, in writing? the correct message. I wanted to start in a place that is not in Nehemiah, but, but it'll take us to Nehemiah. So if you, if you have your Bibles, we're actually going to be camped out in Nehemiah chapter 10 today. Uh, but where I wanted to start was just briefly from Ephesians 5. This is what's said at the end of Ephesians 5. Now Ephesians 5 starts where Paul, he's like, hey, imitate God and love one another the way that, the way that God loves. And so then he goes on and he says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. He's talking about marriage. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I thought it's interesting, as we were talking about family, that there's a purpose for family. There's a purpose why people get together and make promises toward one another. There's always a message that goes with it, but for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, there's a distinct purpose that goes with, specifically, your family, and even more specifically, your marriage. And here's the purpose of your marriage, that your love story would tell the love story of your God. 
that your love story between you and your spouse would tell the love story of a God and his people. One love story tells another. So if you want to know what my kids think about how the Father loves them through Christ, you should ask them how mommy and daddy's marriage is. Because the two will be very, very close. You know, that's the same principle that applies to the city of Delray Beach and the Abbey Church. What the city of Delray Beach thinks about a God who sent his son to die to redeem, forgive, and restore lost people will be read through how we love one another. Family. Family. So we've been walking through this series and we've been talking about disciples, collaboration, leadership, and now we come um, to family and uh, we're, we're going to be, be taking a look at sort of this critical moment where the people of God moved from being uh, people who kind of uh, got together and were familiar with one another to people who were actually family. This is, today we're looking at the journey from familiar to family. And so the, the first six chapters of Nehemiah, there's a, there, it's kind of defined by one word. Uh, there's other words that would probably work, but the word that I was thinking of is co-working. Co-working. If you're following along your outline, you, you'll see it there toward the, toward the top. One through six, you can, de you can define um, the people of God. They came back from exile. You have a little bit of history there in exile, and God started calling people back to Jerusalem. He was going to rebuild his name. He was going to do his thing again to his people, and they started coming back slowly, like 2% of the people. But we're reminded that God always works in the, he works in the margins, and he works with the remnant. He doesn't need a lot. He just needs the faithful and the available. So the faithful and the available started to come back, and God started to redo his thing. This is 400 years before Jesus comes onto the scene. Okay, so the history of God's people has always been that God's going to send a Messiah. He's going to send a Savior. God's going to do something special to his people. But his people were in trouble. Their walls were broken down in their city, and, and the, the name of God was kind of like being shamed. And God's like, okay, no more. We're going to rebuild things. We're going to rebuild the walls and the gates. And then Nehemiah comes back, because in that society, if you couldn't protect your, your God and, and, and the name of the things that you stood for, you were, you, you were weak. You were seen as like less than. And, and so God's like, no, I'm not a less than God. I'm going to rebuild some things here. And, and so he, he uses some people like Ezra, who's somebody who came back and did some teaching and did some spiritual rebuilding. And then he uses Nehemiah to come back and do some um, cultural and physical rebuilding. And so the first six chapters are like God's people coming back through Nehemiah's leadership and, and building up again the walls and the gates and things like that. Important for us to start by understanding this statement. Um, God's vehicle for, for uh, reviving beautiful things is not through walls and it's not through gates, it's through family. God's vehicle for beautiful things is family. He's using the rebuilding of a city. He's using the rebuilding of a gate and, and the reestablishment of some physical stuff. There's some physical things that God's doing where he's expressing himself like, hey, I'm, I'm on the scene again. You can't ignore what I'm doing. But what's really important, far more important than what Nehemiah, the construction project that Nehemiah was about, was this idea of family. That God was going to use the vehicle, not of a better wall, not of better gates, not of a better military, but of a better family to express the beauty of his love for the world around him. He always uses the vehicle of community, of family. He does his best work when we're gathered. And so the first six chapters is, is God basically reassembling his people, and they start working, and, and, but it's, it's kind of defined by this co-working relationship. They're co-workers. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about how they were working shoulder to shoulder, not necessarily face to face. So they knew one another, they were familiar with one another, they were doing good things, but they were, they were primarily like co-workers. And then there's something that changes from, uh, their, in their relationship where it goes from a relationship that's defined by co-working to a relationship that's defined by covenant. Covenant. Now the word covenant is going to be really key for us today because it's the foundation of the family. The covenant is another word for promise. It's, it's different than a contract. A contract is something that you might enter into, and as long as it works out for you and for me, we both stay and, and sort of like um, continue on. 
That's a contract. But if you break a contract, if you breach a contract, then I'm gone or you're gone. A covenant is like, I promise no matter what. Period. Like, I promise. No matter what you put into this relationship, I promise my best. We're not really familiar with covenant talk in 2018. Way more familiar with contract talk. My best, no matter what I get in return. See, that's, that's, that's how God approaches us. That's the promise that he gives us. And then he says, now, go and love one another the way that I've loved you. And make that promise to one another. I'm reminded of the word promise. Uh, if you're a sports fan, you'll think of this tonight. There's a pretty big Game 7 happening tonight, if you're a Celtics fan or a LeBron fan. Mm, mm, mm. We've got the, we, we're continuing with the noises. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Thank you. We love that. <laughs> LeBron wears an I promise bracelet, does he not? And it's like his commitment to basically deliver this amazing product through his services. Sometimes he delivers and sometimes he doesn't. He does his best to deliver, but he can't really always keep that promise. The cool thing about the God we serve is that he's 100%, 100% of the time. And he will always keep his promise. And as a matter of fact, he will always provide what you need to keep your promises to one another as we walk faithfully in Him. It's a good God we serve that calls us to this. Co-working, one through six, they get the walls built. The wall was actually built and put up, and there's a, there's a bit of a celebration um, that happens here along the way. And then um, halfway through the book, or probably, I don't know, halfway through, chapter 10, there's this, uh, there's this scene where they... they Resign or recommit to a covenant. Let's take a look at the journey and then we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive on the covenant. And so, one through six, they're working, they're getting the wall up. Uh, toward, I think it's right at the end of chapter six, you're going to see that the wall was actually uh, finished. Yeah, you can see that. At, so, in verse 15, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elu in 52 days. That's crazy. In 52 days, they finished this product. Um, and so, obviously, the hand of the Lord was upon them. And so, they finished the wall. They worked together. That's a really good moment in Israel history because uh, working together does um, establish something really sweet. You know, I know people at a different level that I've worked together with than I know other people who I've just been friends with. Like, working together has a really cool bond to it. So, we're, we're not diminishing that. We're just saying there was a journey here. And then along the journey that Israel took from familiar to family, they did a couple of things. And, and um, you... You might want to just kind of jot it down. I think it's in your outline if you want to go back and read it this week. But in chapter 7, they gather together. Okay, and so um, Nehemiah calls them together. He's like, all right, we've all been working, doing different things. Now we're going to gather together as like one people. And then in chapter 8, uh, 1 through 8, they, um, uh, they study. They study God's word together. And that's where we see Ezra and other parts of the family coming to help that process. And now, now they're not only gathered together, but, but they're gathered together um, to study and and then later in chapter 8, verses 9 through 18, there's a big celebration. So we see that uh, God's people are celebrating now. So they're doing some, some things besides just co-working. They're, they're gathering. They're studying together. Um, they're celebrating. In chapter 9, they start to confess to one another. They can, it says they confess their sins, verses 1 through 4. Um, in, in chapter 9, a little bit later, there's a remembering where they start to remember their history. Uh, verses uh, 5 through 31 takes us through this whole like journey on, hey, this is where God took his people from back when we were in Egypt, and then he freed us, and he, he, he took us through the desert and was super faithful. So they remember their history. They tell stories um, together. In chapter 9, um, they seek God, and they're like, man, we really need you, God. And so they, they, they uh, intentionally together pursue the person of God. In chapter 10, um, they, they reaffirm the covenant, which we'll look at in just a second. In chapter 11, they live together again. They come and they, they dwell together because there were not a ton of people actually living inside the new walls. You can imagine what it would be like, right, to, to sort of be in this place where the walls were, were crumbled and nobody really lived here. Now all of a sudden the walls go up. It's like God's making a statement like, like here I am again. 
And what happens is when God makes a statement, it never goes unnoticed. When God decides to do something significant, it never goes unnoticed. It attracts people who are called to it, but it also attracts enemies. So when God's going to do something significant in your life, in your family, in this family, understand that it will probably attract more people who are called to it, and it will also attract enemies. It will attract people who don't want that work to go forward. And so we see that happening. And, and so for, for people to go back and live in Jerusalem meant that they were actually going to make themselves a bit more vulnerable because they were attaching themselves to this God who says, I'm back on the scene, now what? And then, and then we see them uh, finishing in chapter 12. And then uh, there's a couple of things they do towards the end of the book. But in chapter 12, there's a, there's a cool worship service where it just gets loud and rowdy. Just get loud and rowdy together. You know, there's all sorts of um, instruments, and, and it's just like really cool, amazing celebration of, of, of who, who God is. And so what I want to do um, together is just kind of walk us through the covenant that they sign, and then talk about how that affects us in our family as well. So I'm in chapter 10, and uh, these verses should be behind me. I'm going to read two of them that give us uh, an idea of what the covenant uh, looked like. And so... Um, the wall's built, people have gathered, there's been some confession of sin together and things like that. And, and so then we come here, um, the rest of the people, so everyone's there, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the people of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, hold on, understand something. So um, in the Old Testament, there was this idea where uh, God was going to basically separate, call his people out from among the nations, and his glory was going to come upon them in such a way that everyone would be attracted to it. Now, in the New Testament, we see a bit of a shift there, where there's still a sense where, where we're called out to be a, 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 set of, a set of people who are, live different and unique from everyone, but rather than being over here and hoping that people come, we now actually take that message to people. What did Jesus say? He, he didn't just say, gather and hope people come. He says, go and make disciples. Okay, so same principle. We, we have a lifestyle that's somewhat separate and completely unique and different from the rest of the world. Like, I view leadership, money, and sexuality different than the world does, for the most part. That's, that's, that's kind of how I have a bit of separate. That, that's kind of how I'm a bit unique. But then, I don't hope that they find me over here. I take that upside down kingdom, as Tim Keller calls it, and I take it to where people live, work, and play. Okay, and so understand that that's kind of what was going on here. God was doing his thing, and he was like saying, these are my unique people. Next slide. <laughs> Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe, okay, here we go. This is kind of the general outline of the covenant. To observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. So basically, what, what they're covenanting to do is to do what God has always called them to do, to, to study God's word, to know God's word, and then to live by God's word. They were making this, this renewed promise that it was like a no matter what. No matter what, no matter who comes, no matter how I feel, no matter what my insides tell me to do or not do, I am promising in this moment that goes far beyond this moment, that in that moment over there, I'm going to continue to walk faithfully in the same direction. I'm not going to be dominated by my feelings, by my friends, by my family. I'm not going to be dominated by anything else besides what I'm committing to in this moment. That's what marriage is like, right? Marriage isn't all, isn't all about the day, it's about the days to come. It's about saying, I promise for the rest of the days to come, no matter what. Now, that's what, that's what God's people were doing in this covenant. They were saying, we promise to you, God, and then there was a secondary promise, basically, to one another, that we're going to walk with our eyes on you together, no matter what may come. For better, for worse. For better, or for worse. As I was thinking about um, the way that this is this covenant talk, right? And I started thinking, what is what is covenant talk that we really understand? What is covenant talk that um, we can kind of 
get our minds behind. Because sometimes it's hard to think about um, what, you know, what happened 400 years before Christ and how that would be played out. And so I think one of the things that we can pretty much understand is the covenant of marriage. And I've used that example a couple of times. And, um, when somebody puts a ring on, on their finger and, and, and they say that I do, you at least understand the idea behind the marriage, right? You at least understand that like this now is saying that this is a, this is a forever thing. And even more so because of what you've heard today and hopefully what you've heard before today, the covenants that we make both in this church and in this marriage are going to tell God's love story. I thought that was really appropriate timing because um, 22 years ago, this week, on a rainy day, just like today, I got to wait in a place that was much like this, only it was outside, right? It was outside. Um, and so that's why I made it a little bit sketchy. But I got to wait in a place like this as I watched, it would be this Thursday, my bride-to-be come down the aisle with, with her dad. It was super cool, but I was also kind of thinking like, oh man, are we going to get this in? Like, I was, I was kind of sketched out by the rain, and I wasn't, wasn't exactly sure how this was all going to work. And to just fast forward the story really quickly for you, it totally dumped tons of rain on us and ruined the outdoor wedding. And so we had to move inside, and it was an amazing time. And if something tells me one more time that you're lucky that it rained on your wedding day, violent things are going to happen for my wife and I too. Because we didn't feel very lucky or blessed or ever like you want to Christian like that. We just were like, oh, that it rained on our wedding. But I was like, all right, Lord, whatever, you know, like, you know it's best, so we'll get married in the, in the country club. But what was really cool is on that day, my wife and I began this story where it was like, okay, hey, this is, the, this is sort of an official moment in our love story, but for the rest of our lives, we are now going to be telling God's love story. We are now going to be telling, hey, as you look at how I love my wife and how she loves me, you are going to be reading the gospel narrative over and over and over again. You're going to get an idea of who God is and how affectionate and how he relentlessly pursues the happiness, the joy, the contentment of another. Now, just to be clear, my wife does not like when I come out with a crowd. I just want you to know that. I don't know if you do that now. She says things like, it reminds me of Bon Jovi, like people are going to put you on their hands and start passing you around. So if the, song bad, if the song Bad Medicine starts playing in your head right now, or like living on a prayer, just ignore that, okay? Because I don't always agree with my wife. I taught seventh grade for 10 years, and I learned that if I don't come down and like hang out with you guys, I, I lose you. So I love to come out and say, hey, what's up? Hi, Jack, what's up? Good to see you, buddy. So today, she, oh, but she did say it's better when you have something to like interact with the crowd with. So, you know, I threw Starburst at you last time. So today I figured, you know, because it's our anniversary week and I never come to my wife. Some of you don't even know she really exists. You just think she makes a good sermon prop. She does exist. <laughs> She's right here. Okay, I'm, I'm getting close. This is Mark. Everybody say, hi, Mark. This is not Catherine, but I'm getting closer. I mean, this is my son, Cole. Hi, Cole. This is my daughter, Caroline. You can thank her for the starburst. She was last week's too. And then this is actually my wife, Catherine, and I have anniversary flowers for you, baby. So I'm good, right? Thursday, I'm good. <laughs> I'm going back on stage now so you can put the Bon Jovi, you know, cassette that's rolling around your line. <laughs> um, you know, my, my wife is uh, a very forgiving woman. It wasn't too many years ago where we found ourselves in a pretty like crazy financial situation because I thought it would be a, a good idea to kind of play like real estate agent and use the equity in our house that we had to go get another one and just like, you know, and then the market crashed. And, um, and we were, at the time, we were just two teachers trying to make it and I don't know, I just got excited about, you know, fear of missing out. I like, that's a real thing. I didn't want to miss out on the big, so I played that card and it hurt us for a while. It hurt us, like living under that financial crippling pressure. 
but it's for a while. Never once, never once has she made me feel like I wasn't a competent leader, that I wasn't the man that she wanted to follow into the fire over and over and over again. Never once has she brought that up. Never once has she reminded me of some of the potential greed and other things that led us and our family into a bad spot. Never once has she made me feel less. So how do you think I view my God when I come to my God and I say, here I am again. I'm so sorry. Do we need to rehearse this? Do we need to talk about this? Do we? And it's like, no, man. Just come here. My mercy is new for you this morning. How do you think my children view the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God? When I come home, I come home and I try to make sure that there's nothing in my hands. Literally, I, I drop it at the door and, and, I, and I put everything down, and everything that I have, I put it under the door and, or next to the door and I come home because I want my hands and my arms to be open for the affection of my family. And it reminds me that now I'm here for them. Like I, I, I have my backpack and stuff like that. I can go get that later, but now I'm here for them. And it's, it's usually like this big greeting. And um, so, you know, the kids are always super happy to see me and my wife's usually doing something. So she's, she's happy I'm home, but kind of for a different reason, right? Like, so now I can help. Not necessarily so now that, you know, like, we, can, we can have this awesome, intimate moment. But, but so every now and then, not every day, or not, not all the time, but I love to be affectionate with my wife. I love, to, I love to come in the kitchen, and we start touching one another, kissing one another, and it's so cool to gross out your kids. I love doing this, right? So as they, as they, the little ones are like, they don't know what's, they just try to come at the end, so we're like, all right, whatever, you kind of ruin the moment, that's cool, we'll let you in too. But Cole and Caroline, they're like, gross, you know, come on, what are you doing? Why do you have, like, get your hands off him, get your hands off her, it's like, like, like settle down, right? They're super, super grossed out by it. And I love it, that's actually like, Wow, I'm doing something right. This is, I must be, like, that's fuel for my fire, right? That's like an amen for a preacher. You know, I learned, my wife told me this, that uh, I forget the study or where you, where you found this out, so probably you'll have to verify it. But um, she said that when children see their parents affectionate toward one another, it actually helps in the prevention of pornography for them. Because it's like sets up like this healthy scene of sexuality as opposed to the perverted scene that the world says. So, you know, I'm, 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 it's easy for me to say like, hey, you know, really this is for you kids. I just, you know, I just, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm giving it up for the team here because I'm protecting you. I wonder how affectionate you think your God is. Do you think your God even likes you? I mean, you know he probably has to love you because of Jesus, that's legally. But, but do you think your God is like super into you and one that like loves to lavish affection on you? Do you think you serve a God that comes home and empties his hands and like runs to you no matter what your performance was that day and just throws his arms around you and it's like, you're mine. Yeah, but no, no, shh, you are mine. Yeah, but, but did you see? Shh, shh, shh. You're mine. I love you. Let's just be close. So if my children are hopefully growing up in a home that sees their God as merciful, graceful, and affectionate, the question for us as a church family is what is the city of Delray Beach seeing based on the way that we interact as a family? Covenant. Covenant. So in a covenant, it actually infers that there would be house rules, correct? So maybe you've seen sort of like banners or, or posters or things like that that say, um, in this house. Um, so we have a few that I wanted to go over in our time remaining of, of, the, of the in this house. Uh, and what I refer to in this house, I don't mean my house, I don't mean your house, although I think it would be great if you asked yourself this question, are these rules of our house? I mean in this house, in this particular house, in this particular family of the Avenue Church. So in this house, Based on what we see in Nehemiah and his journey from familiar to family, we, we work together. In this house, we work together. I want to remind you that you're, you're at a church in year seven, not in year 27. So what that means is that we have needs that you would actually have to fill that are um, not 
inside your gift mix. If you come to this church 20 years from now, I will have no hair and glasses. I know that's how I'm going out. I've already told you this. I'm not doing the big hair ring. I'm just gone and glasses. That's what's happening. <laughs> I will have probably help getting down off the stage to come out and hang out with you guys. Amen. But you will probably be able to come to this church in 20 years and not have to work. You, you probably would have that luxury. You'd probably be big enough and have enough systems and things like that in place where you could hear about a need in Avenue Kids, or you could hear about a need in Foster Parents Signed Out, or you could hear about a need um, in, in this particular event we're trying to do, and you could be like, maybe, maybe not. But we're not there yet. We're, we're, still, we're still becoming this family. We're still on our way. And so when you hear about needs, that's not like, hey, somebody else has probably got that. That's like, how? What's my response to that? Because that's part of us becoming a family. We gather together. It's super important you're here. I told you that as we started. We gather together, just like Nehemiah had to call all the people. He could have like somehow remotely probably tried to get his message out there. And I understand there are certain people who are sick who can't make it up. Like, I get it. And this is not a, hey, like, I love that you're checking us out online. And if you want to share this, do it. Share it online. So this is not condemnation that you're not here. It's just like, hey, like, do your best to be here. Do your best to be here all the time because it matters that we gather together. There's something special when I touch and see and talk to you that cannot happen via text or online. We study together. It's cool when we study together. That's what a family does. A family also studies together when we open God's word together. It's awesome that you guys are opening God's word in your own homes and maybe with your families, hopefully, but it's, there's something, again, special when a family comes and studies God's word together. What's happening now couldn't happen outside of this moment. Even if you had Matt Chandler hanging out in your living room, it just couldn't happen outside of the family coming together. We celebrate together. We celebrate together. It's part of our commission as becoming a family that we learn to celebrate together. Like, that's a really big deal. When we get together, it shouldn't just be me talking to you and then us leaving drinking cold brew coffee. That, that's cool. That's a part of it. But that can't be everything. We have to be able to celebrate together. That's why when we do baptisms or, or, or we do celebration of life or we bring new members up, it's a big deal for us. We like to celebrate that. I just wanted to stop and celebrate together right now. We're going we're gonna to try it out. There are some women that just completed a, I don't know how long the study was, but they completed a study. I got to go to their breakfast and eat breakfast with them and encourage them, but I wanted us as a congregation to encourage them. So if you were part of that last female women's study, I forget what it was called. What was it called, Janice? None like him. None like him. If you were part of None Like Him, or you happen to be part of a new study that I know Ann just started, would you stand up and we just recognize you and celebrate you? Go ahead, stand up, ladies. Gentlemen, we just started to study on Wednesday nights, week one. You can still sign up. There'll be a table in the back. If you are part of that men's study that just happened this Wednesday, would you stand up so we can celebrate you? Why would we celebrate? It's like, ah, they, you know, so they came to a study. Don't, no. No, that's where, that's where, we, that's where we mess up. You didn't just come to a study. You stopped your lives. You arranged childcare in many cases, or you took children with you, or you were away from one family, or you left work early. You stopped what you were doing to be with God's family. That's a really big deal. Do not underestimate the power of the family gathering together to study together. So yes, we will celebrate your simple attendance in one of those events. Because that is one of the things that God uses to form us together as a family. We confess together. Have you ever been in a group, call it an accountability group or a, a DNA group, that's, kind of, that's the term we use around here, yada group, whatever, and um, it's, it's going pretty well for a while and then all of a sudden somebody drops something deep and you're like, whoa, like, we just went to the deep end. I prefer the shallow end. I feel more control in the shallow end. I can reach the wall in the shallow end. But what you just shared took us to the deep end. 
Where now it's like, oh, things just got real up in here. And then what happens, here's what happens. We call it contagious vulnerability. What happens is then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, so maybe it's safe if I share. And then all of a sudden you leave that group and it wasn't just DNA or accountability or hanging out with your sponsor as normal. It was like, oh, we just had a family gathering. Like the family just got together. We confess together because it draws us close as a family. This week um, was the end of my son's baseball season, and it was a really cool season. They had a lot of firsts. He hit his first over-the-fence home run, which is amazing to, to be there and be a part of it, things like that. They made the playoffs, and they made it all the way to the finals. We've never done this. In the county, a ton of county teams, they made it to the finals. Super, super awesome. Um, somewhere in the midst of the end of the season, I got to realize, like, um, you know, this is the last time I'm going to coach him, really, because he's at the end of his little league career, and now he'll continue to play, and I'll just get to be a uh, you know, spectator dad, which is awesome. But I realized there was this time where, where he had been um, struggling a bit and trying to do the right thing, but he was just struggling a little bit. But he wasn't, he didn't look the way I wanted him to look. Does that ever happen with your kids or somebody? Like, they're trying to do the right thing, they're just not doing it quick enough and soon enough into the way that I wanted them to do it. And so it bothered me, and I was, I was like angry. So I went to my buddy that I shared life with, and I was like, yo, like, here's the deal, man. Um, why am I so angry? Why, why was I so upset at my son? He was out there on the pitchers not he was he was doing his very best to stay present and get on with the next pitch But I just I just wanted to correct everything his body language this this and that And he was just like man like it seemed really clear after sharing this with, with my buddy that the problem was me Like the expectations I was putting on my son were not the expectations that my father put on me Here's what, my, here's what my dad says. When you struggle, you know, like when you go back to your old habits, your anxiety loops, and you find yourself caught up there, I'm not like, like crossing my arms saying, dude, you're making me look bad. Get it together, bro. Come on, get your shoulders, get this, get that. Like, get it together sooner. My father doesn't enter into my shame and suffering like that. He's like, invites me to better. He joins with me in that journey, and he gently leads me out. But I was watching my 12-year-old boy struggle, thinking, mm, what do I have to do? And so I had to confess that to him. I was like, look, man, I'm sorry that your dad puts expectations on you that are not fair. And they're not necessarily the ones that, that, that my Heavenly Father puts on me. And so I want to commit to you that I'm going to join you. I'm going to walk with this through you. And I'm, we're going to keep heading in the right direction. And I'm, I'm with you and for you, man. Basically, I'm sorry if I haven't communicated that. I got to confess to my son. We became more family. I'm getting to confess to you right now. I'm practicing this. When we practice this together, Jesus gets to be a real big deal in that. Because I'm reminded of my weakness and his grace to me in the midst of that. I'm reminded of his power to me in the midst of that. I'm reminded of the ability that I have to change because of Christ in the midst of that. Remember, we're not confessing just for confession's sake. We're confessing because it's telling the love story of the God who's redeemed us to the city that's watching. We remember together. You guys remember when we, when we had our first launch meeting and we were in uh, Palm Partners uh, upstairs and, and it was like, we're like, oh man, maybe we're not going to be able to have church here because it's too, it's too crowded. Does anybody remember that? A couple of you might have been there for that, that initial launch meeting. Like, oh man, this thing's my work. That's crazy. Might not be unemployed in a year. I can't believe that. That's going to be awesome. You know, and then, do you guys remember when we were in the community center? Anybody remember the community center? That was pretty cool. That was legit. And then there was this, this time where it was like, oh man, it seems like the rooms are not exactly what our kids need. We're, we're getting a lot of kids in here and, and, and we're thinking about young families and stuff like that. We're gonna probably need to move to, to Atlantic. And remember when we moved to Atlantic and we like, we, we actually raised some money for that? Remember we talked about money, we're like, hey, there's gonna be a need, can you help out? And you guys totally helped out above and beyond. I think we, we fulfilled that 102% and, and, and we made that a reality and we made some shifts and things like that. And, yeah. Remember when we moved our offices to Trinity? And remember when? Remember when God was faithful the whole time? 
Remember how God met us at each season was just faithful and provided, and then he was faithful again, and he provided, and then he was faithful again, and then he provided? Remembering and telling stories of the past is a really big deal because it reminds us of that God who has been faithful in every step of the way. We covenant together. There, there are uh, about, I don't know the exact number, but there was a crew of you that just went through the last onboarding class, which is our new membership journey. And uh, there, there are some of you uh, who will be a part of that who will then, um, uh, uh, you'll want to become a member. And, and then in that process, we actually have a covenant here at the Avenue Church that's similar to the covenant that you saw on the screens. It's more fleshed out as it pertains to your life here, like what you're promising to, what the church is promising to. But we actually covenant with people. And we have members. I think we have like 130 or I don't know what Mitch knows, but 130 plus members who have covenanted to say, hey, I'm going to do family here. Um, and what's important about that is like, hey, if you... If, I'm not here to sell church membership or say this or that because some churches don't believe in it. That's fine. I'm just here to say that one of the leading metaphors in the New Testament about the church is the body of Christ. And the body has members. And the members are inseparable. And so we love that metaphor. And we're like, hey, let, let's do something that, that like the world and us, we would all understand. And let's do something that's biblical because we see it. Like, I just read you a covenant. And so... Why don't, we, why don't we agree to a few things where we're going to be consistent on it as a family together? And so we, we, you know, we have that, and, and, and we covenant together, and, and we ask of you to step forward on a few things, and, and you ask of us to step forward on a few things, and, and, it's, and it's a big deal. And it's a big deal because remember, um, it's cool if you're, if you're dating the church. You know, like if you're new here, you're new to the city, and you're, you're kind of dating a couple of churches, that's fine. You should. You should know, you should know how, like what our theology is. You should know how my family life is. You should know what we believe. How, how, what's the governance here? How are we led? What do, are we reformed? Are we this? Are we that? Like, are we really into Jesus? Or does he just get tacked on at the end? Like, you should, you should, you should date, and you should do your due diligence. But then if you're living with the church without marrying the church, then what you're doing is you're using the benefits of the church without giving the best of yourself. That's probably not the story that you would want to be telling to the outside world about how God loves us. So that's why we think it's, it's a big deal. You know, that, that you have a, a, a commitment to a local church, whether it's here or somewhere else. Like, hey, this, this is like my family. And, and I've been here long enough to say, I can see what God's doing, I want to join it, and I'm, I'm covenanting to join that particular church. It's a big deal. And then, and then some of you would, would um, you'd be abusing the church. And, and those would be, sometimes, you know, you come here and there, and, and, but you're, you're always ready for um, the criticism or the negativity towards what's not right here. And again, that's a story that the city and a ton of lost people are looking at and beginning to form around the God and his son named Jesus. I'm going to challenge you guys on that. We dwell together. We get together and we live together. We have people over. We, we go to the group. Like we, we make time for one another as, as Israel did and we worship together. And that's what we're going to do here um, as we close. So I'm going to call our team up and uh, we're going to prepare to worship because that's the, that's the last thing. All these are highlighted uh, there on your on your um, outline that we worship together. You know, it's a really big deal that we worship together. Again, I love Bethel worship in my room on Saturday night. It does something to my heart. Give me some king in my heart, give me some tremble, give me some awesome, and I'm like, it's there. But there's something different that happens when I stand with you and I worship my king together with my family. You know why? Because Jesus is our older brother. I don't know if you think much of Jesus as your older brother. Maybe you think of Jesus as your Savior, which he is. Maybe you think of Jesus as your Lord, which he is. But when we think about Jesus in this context and we look at the scriptures, we, we see that we're actually co-heirs with Christ. And, and we see that in Hebrews, um, that it talks about this, this idea of um, like a family concept and, and one of many brothers. And it, and it likens Jesus to one of our brothers, an older brother. And so um, some, some theology about Jesus as we prepare to worship Jesus. Jesus is fully human, fully God. He's the one who came and, and, and um, went on this rescue mission. 
to redeem us. So he's redeemer, he's savior. What that means is that our sins have separated us from a holy and righteous and loving God. And in response to that, there's, there's two streams that we can walk down. We can walk down the stream of being outside of God's favor and love because, because of the sinfulness of our hearts and because of his righteousness. And, and that's a reality for many people. Or we can walk down the stream of receiving God's grace by coming to Christ and Christ alone. And the way, the way that's possible is that God the Son, Jesus, came and he lived a perfect life. And then he went to a cross. And on the cross, as our Savior and our Lord and our older brother, here was, here, was the, here was the theme. Father, don't punish the younger brothers and sisters. Punish me, the, the older brother. Let me take the blame. And so the wrath of the father was poured out on the wrath of the older brother. And on the third day, the older brother, he absorbed the wrath and the sin that you and I have committed. But then, but then he rose from the dead. He overcame that sin. He overcame that death. And the, the older brother lives. And that's awesome for the older brother, but it's awesome for you and for me because it proves that he has power over sin and death. It proves that he can actually offer forgiveness over sin and death if we come and we receive it. And so we're invited to turn from our sin, to turn from ourself and our life outside of Christ and surrender to the person, the work, and the older brother of Jesus. Saying, Jesus, I, I can't in me, but you can in have. I trust you as my Savior, the one who stood in my place. I trust you as my Lord, the one who I, I, I will now follow through faith because you have my good. You are my treasure. I trust you as my older brother, the one who is actually not only modeling and setting the rules for this family, but the one who gives us the means by which to carry these rules out. I don't know what you think about older brothers. I don't know what your, your um, experience with an older brother was or, or is, but this older brother is very protective. This older brother is bigger and badder than your worst enemy. This older brother loves to spend time with you. This older brother is relentlessly pursuing your good and inviting you to join you. Let's now worship our older brother, Jesus. Hey, so as we close today, we just want to encourage you. Um, just do the next right thing. So as it pertains to this family here at the Avenue Church, just do the next right thing. I don't know what that might be for you, but we have a couple of things coming up where you can actually take a step into moving from familiar with us to family. We have the men's study. Um, I know that Janice has some uh, uh, six-week uh, small, smaller group uh, female things that you could be a part of. I know she's got something kicking off in the fall. Um, I know there's a welcome dinner, actually, for, for those of you who are kind of new to the Avenue Church. It's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's an onboarding class that's going to be coming up in July that helps you to learn more about the church and maybe take that next step as a family member. Just do the next right thing. Maybe just contact somebody here in the family and get together and hang out. Enjoy one another's fellowship. But as you do the next right thing, you do the next right thing, you do the next right thing, we're believing that you're going to join that journey. We're going to pray for it now. From familiar to family. And then the city of Delray Beach is going to be like, I don't know what's up with the Advent Church, but they must serve a God who loves them, who's affectionate toward them, and who has something for me as well. It starts here. We're going to ask our prayer partners to come up and we'll continue the music going behind me. If, if you want, if you have a prayer need, something you want to pray it over, we'd love to be able to do that for you. Some of you need to come and trust Jesus as your older brother. Man, this would be a great day to do that. Just hang out with us for a little bit. It's raining, so don't, you don't need to hurry off anywhere. Have some coffee, grab your kids, and let's just, let's just do a little family, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be together as a family. Lord, we know that special things happen here. We know people get saved. We know people make decisions to follow you, oftentimes, in a family gathering. And so I'm just praying even right now that you would be stirring in the hearts of those who you're calling Jesus to trust you as the safe, protective, and affectionate older brother. That they would even come forward now and be prayed over. And they would share that with somebody in prayer and, and uh, they'd be able to receive uh, you, Jesus, as their as their older brother. 
Lord, I, I ask that you would uh, help bring healing where there's healing that needs to happen in this family. I pray that you would bring encouragement where there's encouragement needed. And, and Father, I'm thankful for celebration. Lord, I'm thankful that we can celebrate one another as a family. Lord, in this Memorial Day weekend, we think of the great sacrifice that many men and women have given um, so that we might be here and enjoy this moment. Lord, it reminds us of that great sacrifice that you've given to purchase our ultimate freedom. So God, we pray that you would give us just a moment of unhurried margin where we would turn to those around us and we would simply be who you've called us to be. Lord, we love you and we pray for your spirit to fill us in all these things. In Christ, we say this. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.